say with that wonderful introduction I hope I do uh, pretty well <laughs> I have to follow along there um, so like Sandy said um, I've been really really um, interested in getting to know the family um, this is a wonderful resource uh, to to learn a whole bunch of stuff that's not actually in the history books and seeing how uh, each individual member of the family kind of reacted to different situations that they were faced with. And plus you get, it, get you know, the good gossip also, because um, that's what they were sharing back and forth. You know, it wasn't just about this is the important thing that's happening. It's like, you know who, what so-and-so did. Um, so like Sandy said, I work at TELUS, which is more of a science museum, less history. Um, but I've always been uh, really interested, especially in this kind of time period of the 1800s. Uh, as an anthropology uh, undergraduate, one of my projects was working on figuring out uh, what we might potentially find on a survey on an old plantation home. And so that was going to the courthouse and digging through all the documents. And that's when I learned it's not easy to read the handwriting. Um, it takes you a little bit of time and, and effort. Um, and 
I had said that I worked on it since 2012, but as Sandy said, apparently it's 2011. Um, so it's been been a long time. Let's see. So roughly, what I'm going to do is go over what are the letters themselves, and how do we study them? What do we do? Um, how do we preserve them? All of that kind of information. Um, and who's the young family? I'm not going to go into huge detail because I'd rather spend more time sharing uh, some of the fun things from the letters themselves. And then what, what can we learn? So what are we learning from the letters? How can we put them into context? So first, what are the letters? Uh, they range from approximately the 1820s. Those are the earliest, I think it's like 1824 is the, is the first letter. Um, and they mainly kind of, you know, end off about the 1930s. There's a few kind of a smattering here and there, though, a little bit uh, later. Um, so really, it's over a hundred years of one family's history, um, and it's not just one or two people. They're sh they're saving uh, everything, <laughs> uh, just letters, uh, other sorts of documents, and even though they don't seem like they might be that important, every single one of them actually tells a story, and you bring it together like that. Um, so there's over three thousand different object numbers. Uh, but there's many, many, many more pages than that. Um, that each individual letter gets a number. There might be five pages, six pages, four pages. Sometimes it's only two pages, but they have enough written on there to be three pages. So some of the things that are included are things like this. It's like a statement of an account. Um, and it seems really mundane uh, in the sense of, like, why would you keep a receipt? But for us, looking back, it's actually telling us a lot of information into what the family was buying, uh, what they were doing, what stuff cost back then. Um, so in this case, this is 1851, and it, they bought silk tissue, 13 and a half yards worth. I'm assuming that was probably going to be some sort of dress uh, for that. And so I figured it up using the inflation calculator, uh, that would be about $300 worth of fabric there, uh, $58 for a pair of walking shoes, and about $19 for the worked collar. Um, now, the one interesting thing, let's see, is this the pointer? He's here, they bought two granite jugs, and I just kind of want to know what they were going to do with that. I have no idea. <laughs> But that is saying that something that you might not even think of is a granite jug, something I wouldn't have thought of that people might be purchasing. Um, and so that kind of gives you an avenue of research to kind of you know, look and see uh, what that might have possibly been used for. So kind of in this line, this is an example. There's other bills. There's overdue notices saying, you know, you, you need to pay us. Uh, it's been a month. Uh, there's bank statements. Uh, there's even menus. Uh, that I believe that PMB Young brought back when he was in uh, Paris. So it lists the wine prices <laughs> for the red and the whites. Um, it also gives information about when you're looking at them together about the situations that were facing the family. So if it was a particularly bad crop year, they might not be paying the bills quite right on time uh, because they need to actually have the money to buy other seeds, that sort of thing like that, so they can plant for the next year. Also, the one thing that I realized in looking at this, not just these, but the letters in total, is everybody was looking for money. Uh, everybody's borrowing from everybody else. Uh, you have this idea that, you know, they live on this in this big house and they have all of this land and they've got all of this money but um, perhaps compared to other people at the time they did but they still you know they were cash poor in some sense another thing that's interesting is it's actually got some homework uh, so I believe this is uh, PMB Young's homework from West Point uh, he was taking French uh, so it's interesting to see what sort of was expected um, as a basic education. Um, kind of think, you know, oh, we just now are interested in people learning other languages and things like that. But this was preparing him uh, for his 
later, uh, when he did go to Paris, he was able to communicate and understand, and that, that was very helpful for him uh, in preparing um, for what their future were going to be. Uh, there's also some of uh, PMB's report cards. Um, he did pretty well. <laughs> uh, there's also the listing of whether or not he got any demerits when he was at West Point, um, which he mostly did not, so he was pretty good. Uh, education in general was important to the family. Uh, you would think since they kept this, it meant something, something to them. And so they were really interested in, um, especially you know, from parents, educating the children really well so that they could go on and bring um, honor to the family. So we also have a lot of stuff about politics. Um, to the left here is actually um, a speech written by PMB Young and I believe based on the topic it was uh, from when he was the United States Commissioner to the Paris Exposition in 1878 as he's talking about the relationship between the United States and France. You also have land surveys, deeds, uh, indentures, all of that. Um, this one's actually one of the better ones or since it actually has a drawing, a lot of them uh, say something like, start at the oak on the west side of the property and then it's going to be the east corner of the west lot on the northeast portion. And it's a long, <laughs> very long list. Um, and when transcribing, you have to go back and double check a lot uh, because did you skip a line when you get into those especially. So because there were several doctors in the family, uh, there is actually a fair bit of discussion about medicine and uh, medical practices. And now this is over and above just the general, you know, how is everybody doing? We're all well here or somebody else was sick. Um, so this letter uh, to the left uh, is from a friend of Dr. Young's um, and it's dated 1827. And the friend is actually in Philadelphia and he's attending uh, the medical college there. Uh, it's a very long letter uh, talking about a lot of different medical things. Uh, but I thought I would share this. Uh, there are a few cases of typhus, mighty or in almshouse, all of which are giving way under the use of Dr. Chapman's practice. Depletion, topical and general antiphlogistic regimen, effervescent drafts, and Dover's powders. After having reduced excitement, he orders acetate of morphium. This last article, he says, allays irritation relieves subsultus tendinum and composes to sleep without being productive of those disagreeable symptoms that are attendant on the use of the narcotized opium. So in this case, the typhus meteor, this was, I had to do some research to figure out what this is talking about. This is actually a mild case of typhus. So I feel like all of this other stuff probably wasn't helping any. <laughs> they were gonna recover anyway. Um, and the subsultus tendinum is tremors. So um, essentially you get doped up on morphium and you probably do feel better. <laughs> uh, the second letter here is uh, to uh, 1838 uh, from Thomas Hamilton uh, to Robert Young. Um, this, uh, Thomas Hamilton is actually in Cassville writing to uh, Robert Young in Spartanburg. On the day before yesterday, I visited your boy Billy, who was complaining of a good deal of pain in the eye affected with cataract, attended with some febrile symptoms, among which was a firm, full, and frequent pulse. I bled him to perceptible relaxation, gave him 15 grams calomel, and directed Mr. Bagwell to give him a large dose of salts within two or three hours afterwards, and to apply leeches to his temples, if they could be easily obtained. The strict observance of the antiphlogistic regimen was enjoined, and I presume he is relieved by this time. I expect, however, to see him tomorrow, and if anything more be necessary, the best that I can do shall be done. Personally, after that treatment, I would just tell him I was feeling good, <laughs> uh, and that's okay. You don't need to come back and visit anymore. So to kind of back up a little bit, we have all of these letters 
and documents. So what are you actually going to do? Um, first, you have to figure out what you actually have. So sorting everything out. Um, which letters, which pages actually go with which? Um, which is this stuff that was in an envelope? Is it outside of the envelope? Is this the correct envelope that goes with the letter? Uh, sometimes there are situations where the organization of the letter, letters or documents tells you something. They're grouped together. Uh, sometimes there is no organization. Um, it's kind of like when you just stuff all of your bills and other documents and you're like, I'm going to deal with it later. And then if you're anything like me, you often don't deal with it later. It still sits there and it gets moved around. So there's not really any order to it. So you've got sorting out the letters. You create a numbering system that helps to track. And that number lives with that document. And that's the one that tells you everything that you need to know. Um, that gives you a chance to include the metadata, so things like uh, where did this letter come from, where, when did you get it, how have you processed it, uh, from whom, what history relates to the letters as a whole. So a pretty typical system, um, which is what we use at the Bartow History Museum, also TELUS uses the same kind of numbering system because we're still managing collections. And so a lot of times the the same basic things that you do carry across depending on, you know, it doesn't matter what collection that you actually have. So a pretty typical system is to have the year and then the donation number of that year and then the individual number for each one of the uh, individual objects. Or in some cases you could have a folder or a group of objects that share, share a number. So make sure I got this number right, 2005.36 is actually the uh, number for this collection. So everything 2005.36.3015, whichever. That, so that, know, that way you know when you come across that letter, you know exactly what it's related to. So the other thing that was great uh, in the processing of this collection is that everything was scanned. Um, that's really important. Um, for one thing, it creates a copy of it just in case something happens. Because we want to be able to have this information and share it you know, for as long as we possibly can. And these letters are already, some of them, 200 years old. And with that in mind, you also want to limit how much you actually are using each one of these letters. Um, you also don't want to, you know, you want to have your coffee or your water or something like that. Well, no, you can't. <laughs> Not when you're dealing with the letters. But if you're dealing with the scan, that's fine, you can sit and you can work on it. Plus, it's also easier to share with other researchers who might not possibly be able to come to your location and look at everything. Um, if I remember correctly, uh, Professor Hebert, uh had some of his um, students working on things, so we sent them the scans so that they were able to work as a part of their school project. And now that we have them, you have to store them. Uh, you want to store them in a safe place, uh, ideally climate controlled. Um, changing things around in terms of temperature and that sort of thing like that, especially paper documents, tend, tend not to like that. Um, and then archival safe folders and um, boxes. And that helps you uh, keep the letters from getting further damage. And it also keeps the necessary information with the letter. So in this case, we're not writing the numbers on each individual letter. We're writing it onto the folder. So we're not adding any sort of other uh, damage or anything like that to the, to the letters. So next steps. And even though we're dealing with 200-year-old letters, we are in the 21st century. So we put everything into a computer. <laughs> um, again, this is a way that we're tracking. This is the same system, even though this is TELUS. We all use the same system as past perfect. Um, and you can see you've got objects. Uh, then you get the library and you have archives options there um, so that you can group everything together. Um, this was very, very helpful having everything in the database when I was developing this presentation because I can actually do a search uh, you know, on topics or any particular thing that I'm looking for as opposed to going through each individual page of trying to find something. 
And then the fun part is actually uh, transcribing uh, to get a chance to do that and read all of the different stories. And then you can do your research based on what you have um, once you have actually done your transcription. And so I was going to hand these out to give everybody kind of a little taste. And try your hand at transcribing. And I will go ahead and say this is actually a pretty nice one. It's, it's, it's fairly well legibly written. <laughs> Not all of them are this good. <laughs> and I actually made enough copies. That's good. <laughs> Does anybody want to take a stab at it? Okay, I'll give you a minute. <laughs> well, you probably read this one already anyway. <laughs> So that, to, to finish that off, just because I cut it off there, is with the most agonizing pangs. So that's actually well done. <laughs> that's very good. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yes. Yes, it is actually really nice handwriting. And I I'm feel that you could probably tell that this is a love letter. Um, so uh, this is uh, Thomas Jones writing to his, um, who would become his first wife, so fiance at this time. Um, so they've already gotten engaged, um, but it's a very long engagement. So there's many letters that are going back and forth. Um, so yeah, so this one, uh, so you cannot imagine the degree of pleasure the sight of your letter afforded me this morning when I called for my mail and must assure you how much I feel indebted for your promptness in responding, which is the best proof to my mind that my own epistles are gladly received and perused by her in whom alone of all the sects I feel the least degree of interest and on whose love all my hopes of happiness depend. So uh, he gets a little flowery there. It took me a little bit reading that sentence a couple times. It does, yeah, but he got a little carried away. <laughs> so uh, as this is kind of an indicator, uh, transcribing is easier said than done. Um, you've got issues with handwriting. So you have this is kind of your idealized, this is great. If everybody wrote this way, it'd be easy. Uh, then you actually have this. <laughs> um, so it's a much sloppier. Uh, you have different situations where some people's handwriting, this is not very good. Uh, you also have where 
I just need to write this letter really quick because I need to catch the mail or somebody's going to the post office and so I need to just get that there. There's quite a lot of apologies um, either at the beginning or the end of the letter of like, sorry, this is so horribly written. Um, I hope you can read it. <laughs> okay. Uh, so in, in terms of like understanding what uh, the handwriting is, can anybody give me a guess about what this, this one word might be? Nothing? Okay. So uh, this is actually PMB uh, Young's handwriting. Uh, he has a very wide way that he writes. So all of his letters are kind of spaced out. Um, and he's always in a hurry. <laughs> Basically everything he writes, he's like, you can tell he's just trying to get his ideas down on paper and get it um, out there. So getting to know the individual's handwriting helps. Um, so once you're going through and you've read enough of these, it's like I know this is the way that his handwriting is. It helps you interpret things. Um, context clues really help too. So in this situation, I took that from this sentence. And I don't know if this is going to help anybody to figure out what that word is. So to give you, that's it right there. Well, that's the other thing too. Like these letters have been folded. And you know that stuff gets obscured that way as well. Uh, so just just to help out, to one who has followed the histories of the two nations for a century, it seems most strange. Yeah. Um, and so this is again, this is pretty typical of his handwriting, and um, actually understanding uh, when what he's writing about. So again, this is actually an excerpt from the first letter that I was talking about when he was in Paris, and this is the speech. And so knowing that that's when he's writing, I can figure out that he's actually talking about the relationship between the United States and France. So we are the two nations. Then we have situations like this where we have both not great handwriting and very, very interesting spelling. Um, so in this case, this is um, from Elizabeth Jones to her daughter. It dates to 1848. And um, she tends to spell things phonetically. Um, and that didn't, I did not realize that when I was first working on the letters. And it would take me forever to get through one of the letters and stuff until I started reading it out loud. So when I read it out loud to myself, I was like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. It's, I, I get what she's saying. Um, <clears throat> this one is like, now, Carolyn, I was surprised to hear you talking about my marrying. Who has been quizzing you? It must be the doctor. As I know, he likes a good joke on you now and now. There is never been anything of such a report in this country there, which is T-H-A-R-E, never has been, B-I-N, any foundation for such a report, nothing that, noting that I would marry for love too late for me if I had years back if I married. So married is actually M-A-R-E-D. So that was one that when you read it out loud, married, it makes sense that she'd spell it that way. Uh, it would be for money, as you know, it is a scarce article with us. Now, enough, so enough is actually A space N-U-F, said on this subject forever, and said is S-E-D. I would presume she had some schooling uh, in the sense <coughs> that she could actually uh, write um, this, this letter. Uh, she was older, um, definitely. Uh, when she's writing that. So that is another thing that you're, that you're having to contend with with these letters. You have people who are older and potentially you don't know what sort of medical conditions and things like that that they had um, that affects, you know, because her earlier letters are actually better than this. So it kind of, you know, her quality of writing goes down as she gets older. Exactly. Well, and there's a lot of changes too. It's like even things that you would think uh, would not change, as in people's names uh, going back and forth. So like sometimes they sign uh, like uh, uh, Elizabeth Carolyn Young. Sometimes she's E.C. Sometimes she's Carolyn. Sometimes she's Elizabeth. It depends on who she's writing to and that sort of thing like that. So even things you think it should be the same every time, not always the case. Um, and this is the worst. I'm just saying it's absolutely the worst. You get this. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. Um, so I'm going to just read this last little bit here. Uh, so this is um, from P. B. Young. He's writing from West Point. Look, I slip off sometimes to get a mess of fine oysters. I always think of father when a fine, large New York fellow slips down my greedy throat as big as your hand. Now, my dear mother, write to me often and do not give yourself any uneasiness for me. I am well and hearty as ever in my life. Now, always rest in the conviction that I am at your command as long as I live. I would not have crossed this, but it's my last sheet of this kind. So this is where a scan sometimes comes in uh, really handy because uh, you can rotate whichever way that you need. Also, one of the things I've done in the past is make a negative image of it uh, so that you can actually see the, the other writing. So briefly, and I've already been talking about them. So they would write one, and then they would just turn the page, and then they would write just right over the top of it in the opposite direction. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they, they're, they're, they're flipping it over. So they're this front, back, and then if they didn't want to use another piece of paper, they cross right. So then you'll also get situations where you have, you know, just like anybody else, like PS, and they stick it over around here, and then you have cross right. I mean, there's a lot of... <laughs> which actually gives you a little excitement. So uh, really briefly, because I know I've already been talking about them, and I figure, uh, so this is a very simplified uh, family tree. Um, it's much more, more individuals. Uh, in some places where I should say other children, there's a lot of them. <laughs> and uh, the family is actually all writing to each other. Uh, so originated in uh, Spartanburg, uh, South Carolina. Uh, Robert Young was a trained uh, doctor. Uh, with a practice, but he was looking for ways to improve the situation. So um, he did a fair bit of traveling in Mississippi, which is going to be a, a letter that comes up, uh, to buy lands, and then uh, decided to settle in Georgia. Uh, so his wife is Car Elizabeth Carolyn Young, née Jones. And the family tree comes back around, if you'll see here, once Louisa uh, marries Tom. Uh, and they had four children, George, Robert, Louisa, and Pierce. And Pierce is probably the one you know the most about. <laughs> um, so with most of the family still being up in Spartanburg, that's about 200 miles away, which I think would be roughly, what, about three-day journey back then. Um, there were lots of letters that were going back and forth. So they were a very close family um, in keeping up with what's going on with everybody. Uh, there's a lot of even traveling that's going on back and forth um, and extended visits since it was such a, um, a difference. So in terms of doing transcriptions and the like, you can see there's actually a lot of duplications in names, um, so family names. So you've got Robert in basically multiple <laughs> levels, and so you're not sure which Robert are they talking about, um, you know, which Elizabeth are they talking about. Um, and that's, you know, you use the context clues uh, there. Gosh, I, I mean, oh, way more than that. I mean, in terms of like the real consistent few, I'd probably say about 20. And then you have all of the other people that are, you know, more rare responding to, or it's just a friend or a politician and that sort of thing like that. So yeah, I mean, it's easily, it, it's a lot. I haven't counted, that's a really good question. Figure out how many. It's a lot of types of handwriting, yes. Um, so as a quick little timeline, uh, so Robert Maxwell Young travels to Mississippi um, in 1835 because he's looking to um, hopefully improve his situation. Uh, the family in general was very interested in making sure that uh, they did well um, and you know were, were productive members of society. And uh, so there, there was kind of like always that strive to do better and to do and to do what they can. Um, the young family moves to Cartersville in 1839. Um, so that's really where you see the letters pick up because uh, again they're not living uh, next to the rest of the family uh, anymore. Uh, PMV Young attends the Georgia Military Institute in 1852. So there's a lot of letters back and forth relating to that. Um, he's homesick, uh, especially at the beginning. Uh, then in 1857 he attends West Point. Uh, 
again, there's a lot of letters when it first gets up there because my impression is West Point was not easy at all. It was not something, yes, it was a great honor, but it was a lot of work um, and a lot of uh, privation in that. Uh, so Louisa Young marries uh, Thomas F. Jones. So that's, you're bringing the family tree back around there. Um, and then PMB is elected to the House of Representatives in 1868. So that's where you start seeing a lot of the political letters and that sort of thing like that. So you have different representations of time depending on um, what was going on. So what can we actually learn uh, from the letters? So this one, I know I keep missing Mississippi. Uh, I'm actually originally from Mississippi, so I'm always, my ears are always perfect. Um, so this letter is from Columbus, Mississippi, um, from 1835. Uh, Robert Young has gone down to Mississippi because he's heard that there's a lot of good land that's available there because you have the Choctaw and Chickasaw lands. Uh, were being sold by the government. So the year that he actually uh, goes down there, the federal government sold nearly three million acres of land. Now that's sort of the, you know, this is the big picture. They were selling lands. What does that actually mean? He went there. Um, and it actually sounds like it was really, really miserable. Because he says, I've been here eight days. We've had heavy rains almost every day since my arrival. The streets are some three or four inches deep with mud. There are people here from every portion of the United States, all seeking lands. There are three pretty large public houses at this place. They're not able to accommodate one-tenth of the people. I was fortunate enough to procure a room for Henry Bobo and myself. Anthony Foster came in a few days since. We took him in our room. We have two very small mean beds. Our table fare is worse than you can possibly conceive of. We have plenty of beef and fresh pork, no vegetables but yam potatoes. That's not half cooked. Our bread is half raw, at least three times out of four. Indeed, everything is horribly bad. And to complete our misfortune, I have strong doubt whether we can get any lands on such terms as we will be willing to accede to. My greatest object when I left home. So he's getting there and he's realizing this may not be as good of an opportunity as, as it seemed like it would be at the time. It also gives information that apparently Columbus, Mississippi was not set up to handle this influx of people, um, even though they were trying to get people to come in and to buy. Um, there's a couple of other letters that are from this time where he's writing home. Uh, he says there's a lot of speculators, so we can't really get any land at a good price. He does eventually buy land, and I believe he sells it not long after that because he decided he didn't want uh, to settle there. So I just thought this was a funny one that I wanted to share. <laughs> uh, so this letter is to uh, Robert Young again. Uh, it says, your brother John called on me and spent a night long, not long since. He's in fine health. We had a great deal of conversation about the old times. He told me of his career about Greenville and Spartanburg when, while a law student. One of the best things was that during his stay in Spartanburg, he, he at one time with several others got into a frolic. I like how it, he's already minimizing his here. And he knocked down old Charlie McAbee with a brick bat. Warren R. Davis was the solicitor at that time, and he gave out a bill of indictment against them. They were all fine and came near being sent to jail. Not long after, your brother John applied for license to practice law at Columbia. Warren Davis was one of the examining committee. He commenced the examination. The first question he asked John was what an assault and battery was with a smile on his countenance. Remembering that he, John, was indicted for an assault and battery not long before in Spartanburg, John's reply was that it was knocking down old Charlie McAbee with a brick bat. It put Davis into a roar of laughter and it turned out to John's advantage. <laughs> so he got really lucky. And that's I guess maybe sometimes you shouldn't trust your lawyer. <laughs> See what their past is. Uh, I mentioned earlier that education was really important to the family. Um, so this letter is dated 1846 uh, to uh, Dr. Young um, about George and Robert um, actually going to school. Um, I thought this was interesting. It, it indicates that uh, education was important, but also about the way that money 
and things like that were being handled. Uh, so, dear sir, your son George has just called upon me to know whether himself and Rob could come to school and at what price and the pay. I should be pleased for them to come to school. The price, everything paid at the end of the session, was $75. Per scholar, it paid half in advance, 67 and a half for everything. What I'm indebted to you is cash, of course, and you will have it at cash prices. Half of what may be due, I will say, you can pay in bacon, ham, if you have it, and lard, flour, and cornmeal, flour, and cornmeal. So you got, he would prefer cash, but he'll take what you got. <laughs> um, and that actually, the $75 works out to be about $3,000, uh, you know, in today's money uh, per student. So uh, Robert Young would be paying about $6,000 for his kids to go to school. And that's just the oldest two. were about different situations in their lives. Like you, sometimes you think about this as something as a particularly modern problem or something that you have to deal with. Um, I mean, they were also faced with situations that you have a little more control over. Um, so this one is uh, a letter to Elizabeth Young from her sister. Um, I received your letter in January and I would have written to you long since, but for the arrival of another responsibility in the form of a pretty little girl. Does it not surprise you that this thing happens so often? <laughs> uh, Wadi is only three years old, and I have two others. Indeed, you may say I have three babies, for they are nothing but babies. It is by no means a desirable life to lead, but what cannot be avoided must be endured, I suppose. <laughs> but I am thankful that my children are not deformed and promise to have a reasonable portion of sense. The thought of having a large family is very distressing to me. Um, so children are a joy, but they're also a big responsibility. Um, and so I, I appreciate getting kind of this insight of people sharing things, you know, as they're sharing with their family members of everything that they're going through. So in speaking about the family being very interested in improving their lot in the family name, um, there was a lot of pressure on, on uh, PMB, especially once he was accepted into West Point. The family expected great things from him. Um, and so from his uncle, I read your letter some days ago from West Point and was much gratified with the intelligence it gave us. I may venture to tell you, I hope, that I felt a thrill of pride on its perusal that my nephew should have triumphantly entered our national military school when so many of the sons of our distinguished men your fellows were rejected and sent back to their families with a mortifying acknowledgement. I read your letter to your grandma and the other members of the family who were, with myself, equally delighted with the good news. Let not this, however, elate you too much and cause you to relax your efforts in the path of usefulness and eminence. So be, be happy and proud of your achievements, but we're still, you know, we've got, you got some work to do. But... He didn't spend all of his time working <laughs> and studying and doing that sort of thing like that. Um, so, and I will note that this is a letter from PNB Young to his sister Louisa. He was not writing this to his mom and his dad. About 15 of us went out yesterday afternoon and had some fine sport fishing in the river. We carried a cooking pan and implements with us and after we had caught about 20 or 30, had a grand fish fry and I tell you it was fine. But a, great, but a week ago, we had a great feast of fishes. The cooking was done in my room over the gas. We cooked them in bread pans or tart pans, which the fellows hooked from the mess hall. But what was worst of all, I could not get the smell of fish out of my room by no manner or means. <laughs> and if the inspecting army officer had smelled signs of cooking, it would have given me a pretty hard report. I burnt rags and sugar smelling and, and sprinkled smelling hair grease about the room, but I was only saved by a fellow who bought me a bottle of camphor. He gave the door a good scrubbing down, saturated all the clothes, and thus expelled the fish, but you never smelled such a conglomeration of smells in all your life. The fish is yet predominant. <laughs> so he was enjoying himself as well as working hard. So circling back to the love letters, uh, this was another thing that was interesting in reading this is how much letters were considered to be part of the family. So uh, you would get a letter and you would read or share with everyone else. And so Thomas Jones is saying, please 
don't share these love letters with everybody else in your family. Um, then, he says this several times across multiple letters, then there's a letter that comes in and he says, Kate, I had not the remotest idea that your mother saw all of my letters. What an immense deal of nonsense and stuff she has seen, <laughs> which I am ashamed even to think of. I will try to be a little more circumspect hereafter. <laughs> I know she thinks me a simple, childish fellow, but Kate, you must tell her that I'm not childish about anything else but you. Um, and Kate mentioned several times, or at least we don't have any of her letters to him, but in his responding to her, she also is concerned that he's sharing uh, letters and everything like that. And I think she was a little right to be concerned because he then uh, took letters with him when they went to the cave to do a tour, and he lost them. So... <laughs> And he says, please don't accuse me of carelessness because I lost them. For if I had not regarded them perfectly safe, I should not have carried them. So the one big issue that's facing PMB Young at the pre-Civil War is he's really, really close to graduating um, from West Point. And he's not really sure what he should do. Should he go ahead and resign if Georgia secedes? Should he stay, get his graduation? Um, because the family is like, I mean, that's been the goal is that he's going to graduate from West Point. Uh, they've been looking forward to that. Uh, so there's, there's several letters that are going back and forth uh, between him and other people, the family, that's talking about what do I need to do. Um, so in this letter, it's this, um, a friend of his. It's like, I think you ought to remain at the academy at West Point until the state secedes from the Union. So basically, don't make any decisions yet. Let's see what's going on before you, you finally do that. Once that happens, then immediately resign. Go home and tender your services to the authority of your own state. <coughs> so even at this time, though, there's a lot of letters that are going back and forth that are saying, if you are going to join uh, the Confederate Army, this is what we can offer you. Uh, so this is another situation where he's actually trying to get the best position that he can get. Uh, if he's going to leave behind West Point and graduating and all of that, he's going to try to make sure he's going to a good, good position. Um, I thought this was interesting because it actually gives you um, information about what his possible pay was going to be, which is $108 per month, which works out to about $3,600 in today's money a month. Um, he does actually turn this position down for one in the artillery instead because it was slightly better. And of course it worked out well for him because by the end of the war he was a major general. And my absolute favorite letter in all of it. <laughs> so we all have those relatives that come over and visit that we like them but we don't really want them to stay very long. <laughs> Um, so this one is from Louisa. She's writing to uh, her mother. Um, this is 1869, so she's, she's married. Um, so I was delighted to re receive yours and Ida's letters today. It had been a long time since I'd heard from or written to you, but I do assure you I was not silent from happiness as you imagine. Fanny and her dog spent just one week with me, and though I have always liked Fanny and like her yet, in spite of the dog, it was a relief to all of us when she left. She talks twice as much as her mother ever did and nursed that abominable dog as tenderly as any mother could nurse an infant, sleeps with it, takes it into her lap and feeds it at the table, picks fleas off of it and washes it, etc., etc. <laughs> so yeah, we always have that one relative. <laughs> See, how are we doing on time? Am I going way over? Not long enough? Okay. We'll skip that one. Um, this one's also fun because it's one of those, like, I want to know the story. Like, what happened? Um, you're just getting this one side of it. I suspect this is actually to PMB Young because he had his reputation as quite a ladies' man. Um, and I think this is maybe one of the ladies that he, you know, that he was, um, I wouldn't say courting, but spending time with. Um, and she's mad at him about something. This is, I never was so thunderstruck when I heard a carriage go by and in it there sat Nora. I just couldn't speak and whenever I would look out I could see that, which is underlined. <laughs> Nora and you, those smiles were too brassy, 
too brassy for anybody to enjoy them, but she thought they were sweet. Never mind, I do not know what man was made for. The very idea of taking Nora and refusing me. You will be out in the summer for some ice creams, for Nora doesn't like ice cream and never has it. No more ice cream for me and no more riding with me, so you have got it, so go. <laughs> And I just was like, she doesn't even like ice cream, so there. It's kind of essentially. <laughs> and then this envelope, just in and of itself, is, is really interesting. So it's from 1935. And um, we know it actually made it because it was actually in with all the other letters. So if you can read it, to some descendant of Mrs. Young Jones, Daughter of the late Dr. Robert Young, <laughs> sister of General P. B. Young, Cartersville, Georgia. And so that was actually delivered and it made it. Can you imagine that happening today? <laughs> I doubt it even get to Cartersville. They would probably send it back. So that's what I've got. So. Um, as far as what sort of quill was being used, I honestly have no idea. That's beyond kind of the, my, my skill level there. Um, there are some letters that obviously they were using a guide because there's way, it's way too, I mean, there's no way. A lot of them, though, don't, or at least they're not very specific. You know, you do have kind of it's trailing away. Um, that, I think, uh, in large part depends on whether or not it's sort of an informal letter, just kind of tossing it out there versus one where it's a political letter, like I'm asking for a favor, I'm gonna make effort to make sure that it looks looks good. And then with the envelopes, yeah, there's some way, actually there's not as many envelopes as you would think, because a lot of the letters are folded. Um, and you know later you get some envelopes. There are a few interesting envelopes that have patterns on them, but a lot of them are just plain. I mean, would you agree, Sandy? And morning envelopes, yeah. Not that I've seen. No, I think it's just, it's kind of that sort of thing is like these, we're keeping them and they keep getting added and added to, to the trunks and everything like that in terms of that. Um, it, especially since it goes from you know 1824 all the way through. I mean, this something the family, I think, in general, considered important to keep these and to keep them together, which is, it's a wonderful resource. I'm glad they did. So all those letters don't have to mm -hmm. like one, one thing No. No, they all came from the family income. I'm the one that lives there now. Oh, I see. Okay. And the family, it's only been on one family. It goes all the way down. It's never left the family. 
and singing and um, singing. They used to come out and laugh and try to transfer, <laughs> copy the letters and then do a kind of thing. Well, you graciously let us sit in the parlor where he and we himself would have been, so it was, it was quite fun to do the show. So it's still in the family, and there's still fun. There's still <laughs> more letters. Yeah, and sure. yeah. It's, it's really amazing, and, and, and you get such a, a good view of what's going on and, and everything about the family, and it's just it's a wonder, wonderful, wonderful resource. Has anybody, have y'all collected them like, in a journal so that normal people like Instagram can have We could. That's what his ideas were for students. These aren't on GenWeb. There's a collection of them that are on the, as uh, mentioned, Dr. Hebert from Auburn University. Uh, about a hundred of those, about a hundred of them are on, on that website, which you can access from our website. I think they're both the Civil War. They're both mm -hmm. the Civil War. The Civil War. If I can follow it up, if you're interested, EDHS has a full collection of them. We can find them. You just have to come in here and sit and sit through them. They are public. I was going to say, following up on what you were saying, and you know, one of the, I was going to tell that story, but that's just one of those, you know, we all we all love our jobs, and, and, and the great story is going back to the early days of this project, probably 2005, early, I mean, early 2000, where we were going out to the to the house and going in the attic and, and exploring the trunks. You saw a picture of one of the trunks and sitting in that uh, parlor, particularly, you know, she mentioned she and Tina were in the parlor, the P and B looking over their shoulders, they scan these letters and, and just and having a ball with it. But you know, learning so much and, and, and re back of the work you put into it over the last ten years is remarkable and, and the things that we're able to, to do now because of that work that she put into it. But making these letters available, uh, through those you know, those kind of book projects that we're looking at, make them available online for people that apply and buy. We, we've got the original there, you know, Joe mentioned they've got photocopies. So they're available and, and you know, we, we hope that we were able to make them available to as many of those want to see them. There's a lot of good stuff there. And a lot of good projects. I mean, you know, just you know, that book project, presentations like this, scholars and historians and students who are researching a wide variety of topics. Not just civil war, not just, you know, a certain time period, but family ways, you know, how do, how do you even reserve this? What you can pull a lot of what you just want to There's a lot of things here that, that come from this collection. We appreciate yeah, the family. And, and and you, were, you were in the trunk in the attic not too long ago, and you found this Bible that was there in Whitty. If you ever have you know, that vision in your head of someone's old attic full of treasures, that's the attic. And we just, just that's, if I ever want to bail want to just have a good time, you know, that's why I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, you know, we're talking about the family coming from South Carolina, and, and, you know, in Mississippi and coming back. You know, one time a couple years ago, we were up there and one of the roof slats in the attic has particles of this and put across it. So it was a piece of a, a crate or a trunk that got, you know, moved here with all their stuff in it, but you know, used all the material to build a house. So it was pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Yeah. 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 Well, Rebecca, thank you so much for, for being here and for presenting this and all uh, the work that you have been doing. Thank you. Thank you.